The Tale of Vengeance By Vung Shnagpal. Your fate is near, Stalthurp. Whether thou wilt be successful in this campaign, I knowst not. But I do know, that thy heart wilt be heavy with mindless bloodshed. We may fail. And thou shalt win. But don't underestimate us, for destiny is not foreseeable, even with the finest of foretellers. It is like a book with a misleading cover, thou knowst not how it will end. By Vung Shnagpal. Prologue. There once lived a king of Cretes, Tracy Des was his name, rode he on his horse. With a sword in his hand. With rage and ambition in his mind, he went through the fields strewn with magnolias. Which bloomed on his appearance, when he looked on the sunflowers, they looked back at them. For his face shone as bright as the sun, and inside his heart was kindness, an ability to remove sadness. And he led the way, out of darkness. He led the world out of this abyss. When the world was heading in the wrong direction. He showed them the right one. But alas. He perished that day, when he was killed by one he had helped. And his legacy fell down with a thud. And then the fast and agile horse, stumbled and fell in mud. Characters. Lugio, the previous king of Adion. Andil, the new king of Adion. Serpon, previous king of Cretes. Stalthurp, new king of Cretes. Tyrone, a courtier. Adrelia, wife of Tyrone, later known as goddess of innocence. Ghost of Andil. Ghost of Serpon. Ghost of Stalthurp. Ghost of Adrelia. Arnel, god of the underworld. Theo, a teacher. Rayliet, a courtier of Adion. Armacita, a general of Adion. Tracy Des, an ancient king. Chaldeet, a general for the army of souls. Part 1. War. It comes and goes. Chapter 1. The death of King Lugio. It had recently started to rain on the land of Adion. The soil had turned wet and damp. A certain petriture had been imbued in the atmosphere which forced the birds to flee their shelters and take delight. In the magic of nature. Peacocks had started to dance and rejoice under the clouds, their merry cry echoed through the rejoicing kingdom. The flowers started to bloom, after the merciless heat which had caused them to droop from their usual merry state. Lavenders, lilacs, and roses were rejoicing. The trees were dancing, to the sound of the tapping of fresh rainwater on their foliage. The summer heat had been cooled down by the sudden downpour. Farmers sighed relief, the perennial river had started to flood a little, but was restrained by the helpful dam built by the local farmers. The excited children ran out of their houses and bolted towards the gardens to get wet under the first downpour of monsoon, and to their delight, the rain only strengthened over time. The clouds didn't show a single sign of restraint, much to the happiness of the people who resided under them. It was as if their singular wish had been fulfilled, the heated weather of May, had calmed down after the onset of monsoon. The mothers of the children had arrived to take them home, as they suspected that lightning would soon strike, much to the clamour of children. And it did indeed strike. Claps of thunder roared the sky, and the flashes of lightning lit it up, and tore it apart. The children who recently had smiles on their faces, now showed expressions of distraught and fearfulness. The king was peering outside his majestic and immense window, which had a glorious view over his kingdom. Lugio, which was the king's name, had been known for his greed towards the peasants. Under him, they starved, their bread was snatched from their begging hands and their faces started to wrinkle, and they started to grow thinner and thinner. This was not favorable to the courtiers at all. The courtiers were against the king, and had no choice but to flatter him on his most foolish and greedy decisions, though the king knew the fact that all his appreciation was just mere flattery and nonsense, he tried his best to accumulate fortune, which was later left unattended, and then, soon, spent on the development of overdeveloped places where aristocratic families, who had more than enough resided, and often bathed in overflowing money from the corrupt governments, as they knew that. The aristocrats were the only helpful lot when something like a drought struck, the government used them as a bank, never have I ever seen someone with such an inclination towards gaining fortune, by underwhelming the peasants, who did but suffer and the aristocrats, who also suffered, but at the time of abrupt disaster, and the government, who were middlemen, trying to tie the rope, but instead, made everlasting knots, which did but restrain them from naturally inclining towards each other, and sharing this fortune. It was like a sponge, which accumulated money from the unattended and often unseen and deprived places of the kingdom, and then which squeezed all of this acquired money towards the banks of wealthy families and dishonest and corrupt landlords who often laughed on the grim tune which ran through the slums and deprived places, 
Though, from the bottom of their heart, they knew that this was wrong, but who could deny fortune which flew free to their sides, and to their luck, they had the chance to wash their hands in it. Who could deny? Alas! Now the courtiers were fed up with the cruelties of this corrupt king. They devised a plan to stop this corruption and deprivation and imbalanced wealth over their lands. This involved ruthless murder, even though it was for a worthy cause, and the cause was known to everyone, even the advantageous aristocrats, to the ones who faced this planned anguish. The plan was to organize a feast on the successful restraint of peasant growth towards the more aristocratic sides, and the courtiers put poison in the wine of Lugio, and let him perish in his sleep. The feast commenced, aristocrats from all over arrived to meet and discuss matters of importance towards the king, who merrily welcomed them, and saw in them, reservoirs of fresh cash and advantage. The food was served, and the king, with his courtiers and fellow aristocrats, sat on the large dining table, with a long red cover spanning from its both ends. I, so, how dost everyone now feel, now that the begging peasants have been restrained from entering New Adion, where wealthy and fortunate people like everyone sitting on the table resides? Said the king. Good, sir. Said a courtier, with a voice which sounded honest, but deep down, it was but mere flattery. Let the alcoholic carouse begin, then. Said the king. The servants walked in, with wines and beers, of all kinds, from all over the countries of the world. Which were bought with dishonest cash. Among the ordinary wines of the world, there stood a golden wine which glittered, ostentatiously showing off its sheen, constantly attracting the aristocrats, this type of wine was only found in the neighboring country of Crete. After the party had ended, the supply of golden wine had died, and was only to be restocked the next year, by the contracts that were signed by the Cretan king, Serpon the Great. After the guests had left, the king had his own carouse, in his chamber. When the wine was being prepared, the ministers strewed poison inside it, and served it to the king. The next day, he was no more. There was no other option, than to crown Lugio's young son as the king, and perhaps, this must not be revealed to the new king, how his father was murdered and how he incessantly exploited the peasants, and perhaps he would do no more of that. Chapter 2. Revelation. This sudden death of his beloved father, had caused the young king, who went by the name of Andil, into depression. His mind was frequented with thoughts of woeful voices, and clamorous whispers of take revenge. And like any young soul, his mind was teeming with rage and guilt, if he, by chance, found the murderer of his father, he would have mindlessly slain him without even thinking once. Now, this angry individual, who was in need of political guidance, needed a teacher. His sleep was disturbed every night, by how recklessly he spoke to his father, tis true that one only realizes someone's importance, after he is deprived of that someone. His mother had been snatched from him when he was four, and now that he is of twenty, his father has been snatched away. Aristocrats and courtiers from all around the city came to the cemetery, to attend the funeral, in the middle of the white rose strewn garden, there was the tombstone, which said, He who exploited, he who had several times been avoided, is with us no more. Alas! Now his body, disintegrates into the same earth, where thousands of peasants he had indirectly murdered had died. There was also a statue of Lugio the Terrible, sitting on a mound of thousands of corpses of peasants, and on this mound, throwing away money towards the aristocrats. Andil knelt towards the tomb, his heart heavy with guilt and rage, like a balloon about to explode when incessantly filled with water. Tears broke out. He touched the grave, and paid his respects. Then, Lugio's sword was fitted into a stone, which was then placed near the grave, like a memorabilia. This was a tradition of Adion, every ruler had his sword fitted to a stone near his grave. Someday, my sword would also be fitted to the rock, thought Andil. That was his destiny, everyone's destiny. Everyone has to die, against their will, so as to make place for further generations to occupy the place and exploit the resources. Be it the wisest of scholars, or the most glorious of kings, or the most courageous and chivalrous of knights, one has to perish. One can't be a burden to the earth for too long. Suddenly, as his thoughts were racing past his mind, someone spoke to him, that someone was an old man, who looked familiar to his father. He had a long, white beard and small, shining eyes which glared innocently on Andil. So, you are the newly crowned king, are you? Asked he. Why, yes I am. Do you know the principles of the court? No, I don't. Why? Don't you know, 
I am your new teacher, I go by the name of Theo. Greetings, sir. Greetings. The two of them walked out of the cemetery, on their way to the castle, on their way, Theo spoke. Do you know what killed your father? No, I don't. Shall I tell you? Yes. You might be in the misconception that he overdosed liquor, that night? No, it was all planned, did you know the nature of your father? No you don't, he might have shown you love as a father, but as a king to his nation, he could easily be the worst person you have ever met. He was fed with greed, and exploited the innocent peasants, he squeezed all the wealth from the peasants to the banks of the aristocrats, just like a sponge. It was a planned murder, the courtiers who were fed up with him, for a good cause, had mixed poison in his drinks, he didn't wake up the other day. But, do not tell anyone that I told you this secret, keep it away from the knowledge of the courtiers, and treat them with respect. Said Theo. Andiel's view towards his father had changed completely. Chapter 3. Golden Wine. Andiel's nature had completely changed, from happy and joyful, to stubborn and aggressive. He sat next to the window, peering down to the gigantic statue of Lugio the Terrible. Despite all of the tries of the courtiers to console Andiel, he still stayed gloomy, and spent his time, aloof in his chamber. One day, after a week of isolation, Andiel, stepped out of his room, and sat on his throne, with the courtiers accompanying him. Rayliet, a courtier, spoke, May I know the reason for thy bad mood, my majesty, for thy teacher is arriving soon. Nothing, Rayliet, I am just mourning over my father's death. Replied he. After a brief hour, Theo strode into the castle, Come here, O young king. Let me show you the antics of politics. Said Theo. Andiel and Theo left the castle, and went on a brisk walk around the castle. The ferns were plummeting down, and the remnants of the cloudburst had remained, which left him reminiscing about his father. Every moment, he got more and more confused. Was it good that he had died? Theo was loquaciously reciting him the tales of great kings who had failed due to their greed, and one of the examples was his father. Your father was the most corrupt king, and thus he deserved to fail, it was not folly, it was the need of the hour. Theo said. Andiel was angry now. Rage ran through his mind, making him more stubborn and stubborn, violent thoughts of mindless gore ran through his mind, he wanted vengeance, but his integrity stopped him to do so. Every time, the barricades of integrity got weaker and weaker, facing the stampede of violence and unscrupulous acts. Such a loss had he faced, that he had went mad, his heart had turned heavy, and his mind turned over ambitious. The same feeling of greed that ran through his father's veins, now ran through his. As Theo was eloquently reciting his father's folly, Andiel's mind blew up with rage, he uncontrollably drew his sword, and threw it at Theo, straight on his head. Blood was gushing, as if his head was a spring. His two, shining eyeballs rolled down to Andiel, and his decapitated head rolled down, and fell into the river. Theo's lifeless, blood-stained corpse now lay on the ground, his sword went through Theo's stomach. Andiel pushed his sword out, thoughtless with guilt, what had he done, what demon had ordered him to do so? He can't do this himself. He realized that the demon which told him to do so, was his insidious mind. What a foolish creature, is man, he who looks around the world, every nook and cranny, to find the demon, and to blame him, little does he know that the demon is sitting inside his mind, or perhaps it is his mind. Andiel's vision blurred as every second passed by, his head throbbed painfully, his heart ached badly, and his legs got weaker and weaker until they collapsed and he fell to the ground, with his face hurt badly, his nose bruised and his hands broken. Andiel's eyes closed, flashes of light passed through his mind, pictures from his memory, ran past, his father and mother holding his hand, his mother then being captured and slain, and then as he walked further, his father drank poison and slept forever, now he was alone, aloof from his family, his face transitioned from happy to sadistic, he started growing red horns on his head he turned from an angel into a demon, and finally he saw a tree, under whose shade he rested and slept forever. Like his father. He swooned and fell unconscious. The courtiers found the duo's body, one unconscious and one slain, they carried Theo's body to the graveyard and buried him, while Andiel woke up on his bed, with a glass of golden wine, on his bedside table. It was the same wine he had seen in his brief dream, he picked it up, with suicidal intentions and drank it all. It did not affect him at all, instead, it aroused Andiel's mind, he was bewildered by the wonderful taste of this golden drink as he had never tried it before, 
He drank the whole glass and wanted more. I, courtiers give me some more of this golden wine. Said Andil. Sorry, Majesty, our stock of this had just died, but we still stole the golden berries from Crete's for you, now alas. They will capture us if we enter their kingdom. Said Meliet. I want it now. Even if it included declaring war on Crete's. I want Crete's now. Said he. Chapter 4. The Plan. The courtiers and generals of the army were arranged in the court, to devise a plan, a siege. To Crete's. Oh, sire, Crete's will underpower us. It is nothing but mere danger, inside of which we are mindlessly and foolishly stepping, tis but a folly, and to be foolhardy is not going to help, for they have cannons of gold, and swords of diamonds, we are but mere ants in their scale. How then, are we able to siege it? Said Armacita, a general. One shall never underestimate, for destiny is the path and it's the destination. It is not foreseeable at all, said Andil. But, sire, for that we must have an army strong. Enough. And I see that we lack that. Most of the soldiers have taken a break, and we are but alone. Only some of them, who are the most loyal, stay. He replied. Send a decree, that the soldiers on vacation. Have to come back or else they will be removed from the royal army. Said the king to the messenger. The messenger left the castle with drums and sped his way, roaring the paths, shrieking about this new declaration which gave the citizens a mere suspicion that something distraught will soon shower their lands, it could be blood, or it could be gold, the world is destiny, and destiny is the world. The pleasant sun was setting down, and the bright and lonely moon rose up to take its place, with it came moonlight, which was later blocked by the swelling clouds, and soon the sky became overcast with grey, murky clouds, though the citizens knew it was not going to rain as the clouds were constantly moving away with the brisky strong wind that came from Thebes, which was known as the Thebiet, and with this wind oft times came a swarm of low custs, here to invade the newly grown crops of the innocent farmers. Something abrupt to the Adianians will occur the next day, it is very strange, that war, something which hinders progress and is intentional, comes and goes, and captures innocent souls in its throes. It is all folly, once you broaden your image, the world is folly, its citizens are fools, and nature is the only pure thing which encompasses the gods, the harmony, the serenity, and the peacefulness, which is found nowhere in the urbanized places of the world that have been uprooted by cruel acts of humans, and then restructured and then once again destroyed, and this cycle continuously demands resources from nature, and nature also get its resources by the lifeless corpses which had disintegrated due to the wars. The trilling of grasshoppers was redundant through the city, and the scene in the castle was completely different from that of the suburban areas. Outside the castle, infantry, cavalry, cannons, and elephants, knights and squires, generals and then, sat on the majestic chariot, was the king. They were prepared for the great siege. The scene was horrifying, the night was lit up by gleaming torches, across the whole setup of the army. Crete's was not that far away, they just needed to cross a nearby hill named Theoboritas, and on its side to which faced Crete's, were crops of golden berries from which were made the golden wine, which Andil so desired. They went, marching forward, with the generals and the king leading the way. It had turned midnight till they reached Theoboritas, they still had to climb its way, and then enter Crete's, sneakily, one by one, through the steep slopes of Theoboritas. Chapter 5 The Siege the roar of the marching troops devastated the path that led up to the peak of the hill, the people who resided inside the small huts of Thatch had been aroused and they peered through their windows to look at the horrifying scene. They had reached the peak, and down to the other side of the hill, they could see plantations of golden berries which twinkled and glowed in the dark of the night, that side came into the territory of Crete's, which was ruled by Serpon the Great, and was economically distinguishable than that of Adion which was deprived and exploited on its suburbs, as the remnants of the unscrupulous rule of Lugio ran through these rural areas, left unattended and unseen. The troops had to go down the hill, one by one, so first, the infantry, they unearthed a huge passage, which was nowhere near the site of Cretans, after it was discovered, the infantry, cavalry, the king, the cannons and the elephants started to run through it and landed near the foot of the hill, on the side of Cretes. First, the king rode his chariot out of this passage, into the territory of Crete's, and he saw the broad path leading up to the castle of Serpon, which was laid on the peak of a high foothill, and the steep slopes of the hill were laden with watchtowers with guards who kept their eyes, fixed and out of the window. After the king, 
there followed the massive infantry, cavalry, and the cannons and the elephants. It was night, so the guards of the watchtower were dozing, it was the best time to strike, first, the infantry with cannons went up the castle hill, Kietli, they filled it up with cannonballs and started shooting it at the watchtowers, and after all the watchtowers had collapsed, they tried to shoot it at the castle, but were fearful about the royal Cretans. Inside the palace of Cretes, Serpon, the king was aroused by the knocking of his towers, by cannonballs, and with him woke up his army, who, had an ordeal trying to wake them up from their deep stupor into the mood of fighting to the death. So, they were very weak, and then, the army of Serpon rushed out of the castle, and started to attack, from above the castle, were the bowmen, who missed their target as they had just woken up and their shots were not accurate. The soldiers of the opposing sides fought hard, spears were shot from near the passages cannons were shot up the roof of the castle, Serpon had found shelter against the cannonballs of the Adianians. A lot of soldiers fell dead, their corpses collapsed to the ground, blood-stained, their heads decapitated, their limbs injured and their eyes closed, their faces still had the same smile of valor running through them. The soldiers suddenly rushed up the castle, with a giant log of spruce in their hands and they started to ram it on the immense gate of the mighty castle. The sun rose, the soldiers were still fighting, camps were laid near the outskirts of the hill, one of which was of Andils, until now, the Cretans hadn't unleashed their mighty cannons, which ran as fast as light, and caused damage as injurious as fire. After some more hours of bloodbath, the soldiers returned to their camps to get energized and to start fighting the next day, which was supposed to be more violent as the Cretans would unleash their mighty weapon, the golden cannons. Back at Adion, everyone was safe and sound, they thought that it wasn't that much of a bloodbath as they had foreseen earlier, their thoughts ran like that until the army of Cretes rushed through the same passage, onto the same hill, to the territory of Adion, and started to mindlessly slay the Adionians. They used their limbs, and heads, and compressed them to make stones, which they later used to kin nonce to destroy the diversity of Adion, till now, the aristocrats were safe, and the innocent peasants who lived on the suburbs wer suffering, they had always suffered, but the difference was that now they were suffering more. They were murdered of hunger and thirst earlier, now they are murdered by the Giladin, and by the incessant blood shed by the sword, which pierced their heads, and ripped apart their body into two. Chapter 6 the war. The cannons of Cretes were laid on the roof of the Cretan castle, the cannons were made of gleaming gold and were immense in size, the infantry of Adion rammed the doors, and the door finally, collapsed, on the other side of the door were the infantry of Cretes, who got crushed violently under the door. The Adionians in the camp squirmed in fear of the immense cannons, which, can on one shot devastate more than half of the camps, they needed to be wary of these much feared cannons of destruction. As the infantry rushed inside the Cretan castle, the king of Cretes, went into hiding, into a sequestered bunker, aloof from calamities, with him he took his most favored assassin Stalthorpe, and his courtier, Tyrone. Outside of the bunker, the courtiers were hardly slain, their skulls thrown on a mound, avoided the throne, and then, as if a flash, the cannon shot a straight cannonball towards the camp, but the Adionians were fortuitous as at their area of the camp which was isolated and had no inhabitants. As the land of Cretes was being stained with blood, inside the bunkers of Serpon, a plan of assassination was being devised, the plan was that Stalthorpe, will sneakily enter the camps while the Adionians were sleeping, and then he will enter the chamber of Andil, and he will slay him, scared, the army will also retreat. The infantry rushed more and more deeper inside the castle every moment, and they stole its treasury, and packed them inside a sack. They packed all the golden berries, the golden coins, the jewels, gems and stones. Back in Adion, the same is being done with the Adionians, their houses are being burnt and the castle is being ransacked. Man is surely the victim of his own destruction and destiny, no one ever gives peace a chance, as they think it will be ineffective, but peace is the strongest instrument, which can bear the results of war without the violence. The bodies of innocent peasants were thrown down in the river, where, deep inside was a mound of the corpses of their ancestors, as Cretes, once waged a war on Adion, for the incessant exploiting of Cretan peasants who lived on the border, upon the hill of Theoboritus. The sky was perpetually overcast, the murky grey clouds had amassed themselves in the sky as an army of giant elephants, who moved with the wind towards their target and also spewing some occasional drops of rainwater using their trunks. Dusk reigned in the sky. The infantry returned to the camps to catch a wink, and the king slept late, 
worried about abrupt assassinations which had happened a lot in the history of Adion, and Eel's great-grandfather was once slain when war had been waged on Adion. Finally, the king also slept. Chapter 7 The Death of Andil It was the perfect time to strike for Stalthorp, the moon was looming above their head, and only some guards were awake, who could easily be tackled by Stalthorp. He exited the castle wearing a black mask that would be helpful for him to camouflage in the dark, and then bewilder the guards, so he walked out with his jewel-studded dagger which was known for taking lives out of people. Nothing was to be heard except the rare trill of a grasshopper or an occasional bark of an angry dog, the piercing silence produced a strange ringing sound, and the air that ran in the atmosphere was also aromatic, a fresh scent of nearby roses ran through it, the gales drove fast, making the trees dance under it, owls were still awake, and indefatigably peered through the fields of the castle to look for a prey, an occasional rat or mouse was to be found, which was to be murdered by the claws of the owl and then to be feasted with. Stalthorpe walked into the camp territory of Adion which was strewn with bottles of liquor and bones, probably the bones of a cooked chicken which was part aching by the Adionians to rejuvenate them. His feet tapped against the damp soil of the Cretan lands, wettened by the thunderstorm of the preceding days, as Crete's has a higher elevation than Adion, the lightning had caused some major damage, it had caused wildfires which had nearly spread to the castle but were immediately taken care of by the farmers. Stalthorp had reached the gates, where the safeguards, half drowsy, were standing with spears in their hands, and slumberous thoughts flooding their minds, Stalthorp unleashed his dagger, and crouched towards the safeguards, and quietly stabbed them at their necks so that the jugular vein was bleeding which caused them to perish. After he had got rid of the guards, he walked to the king's chamber, which was located in the middle, the distant snores of the knights were audible from miles and miles away, sneakily. Stalthorp walked inside the camp, and, with his dagger already out, stabbed the sleeping king. On his face, blood streamed out, his head was decapitated so it fell down. Stalthorp peered at the headless, lifeless corpse of Andil and was terrified about he had just done, though normally he didn't look back and moan over someone he has killed but now he was rife with guilt. Something would happen later that night, which would change the history of both the countries, which would further reveal their destiny, and unearth it in a way that it will change history. Chapter 8 Stalthorpe To understand what happens next with Stalthorpe, you need understand his history. First, which was dark and tragic, grim in all its might and thought-provoking too. Stalthorpe was born in the house of a suffering peasant in Adion, whose family had been so deprived that they had to migrate to Crete's, where peasants were not exploited. On the day of their migration, Stalthorpe's father perished after he fell down the cliff of Theoboritas, and his body had been drowned in the river of land, and they didn't even get a chance to bury him. Stalthorpe and his mother, then, saddened by the death of his fathers, migrated without the father to Crete's, where they met a general who was bewildered. Deared by Stalthorpe's agility and strength, and asked his mother if he can join the army it would be very beneficial. Stalthorpe didn't want to enter the army, but was forced to join as he was now the breadwinner of the family, he was trained by Theo, the great sage who had taught generations of kings, in both the kingdoms, Cretes, and Adion. He was much favored by the king, and was the king's favorite because of his argumentative skills and the courage of Stalthorpe was beyond that of his peers, he was exceptional at combat and was sent to foreign campaigns to assassinate kings and ministers, and also served as a detective. He was called, the Serpentine Slayer, because of his oft times quiet and silent, sinewy, and fast movement just like a snake. Though he is now renowned and famous, his past remains dark and mysterious as his mother had tortured him a lot by forcing him to join the army, even after he discovered his motive, his destiny was unknown, he might be the next king of Crete's or might be fired from the job and serve as a peasant, with no identity. Stalthorp returned from the Andeel's camp, teeming with guilt, and the picture of his bloody corpse was stuck in his mind like a magnet, as if it never would leave his eyes, that day he thought he had won, but instead, something would happen which will bewilder him that night. He entered the castle, his blood-stained dagger in his hand, and a strange, psychopathic expression strung on his face, he looked as if he had just escaped an asylum but it turned out he had just killed someone in the command of someone else. He walked up to his bedroom in the giant castle, when he was climbing the stairs, he noticed something bizarre, he heard a whisper, like a serpent had just spoke, 
Kill Serpon. Kill Serpon. Said the voice. These words were uttered by the ghost of Andil. And then suddenly his body was left out of his control for a second, Stalthorpe walked up to his bedroom and on his way, saw Serpon feasting and carousing with his friends on the glorious success and the new land territory of Adion which had came into their hands. Ignoring them, Stalthorpe walked up to his room, and quietly slept. That same night, another event would happen which would awaken the foe of Andil. Chapter 9 The Death of Serpon That night, when Stalthorp had fallen into slumber, the ghost of Andil wandered inside. The castle, steadily wafting through the rose-scented air, which had blown from up the hill of Theoberitas, further passed on by the gales which had drove which had pushed the tempestuous clouds of rain towards Adion and Cretes. It drove through a minuscule gap from between the large door, and entered the castle from there, then it steadily floated up to the chamber in which Stalthorp was slumbering, tangled in bedsheets, and dreaming about the lifeless corpse of Andil, whom he had just slain and was teeming with tremendous guilt, he felt as if his soul was treacherous and full with rage, though, from his inside, he was a kind and generous young man. The ghost then flew up to the slumberous Stalthorp's ear, and then slithered into it, and suddenly, Stalthorp was aroused, his iris had turned white, and he stood up on his bed and walked up to the door, he sneakily opened the door, and abruptly slithered down the stairs, to the king's chamber. The king, in an alcoholic stupor had just drowsily walked to his bedroom and slept, so this was the right time for murder, Stalthorp had forgot his dagger, and suddenly the dagger flew from his bedside table to his hands, and then he entered the sleeping king's chamber, and with his blood-stained dagger stabbed him at his heart, and then suddenly the ghost left his body, his irises turned back to normal and he was left astounded by what lay above his eyes. This day was very bizarre for Stalthorp, he had just slain his rival, and then even his master, what a day. What had took control over him, he had slayed Serpon with the same dagger which he had used for Andil. Two rivals who fought each other were slain by the same dagger, it was astounding to see one's destiny, one's dreams, and one's courage, all to fail at the last moment, to falter at the sight of someone else, someone who is not in this war, ends it. Like two crows fighting over a piece of bread, and while they are fighting, the sky rat one slithers and takes away the prize, and leaves the crows bewildered and shocked with guilt and rage, which doesn't seem fair, but is the rule of the world, survival of the fittest and the smartest. He had to escape the chamber noiselessly, or else the only courtier who was aroused, Tyrone could witness this murder. That night, something else was also going to occur, which will trigger the War of Souls, the Wars of Wars, the War of the Mightiest, the one which will decide the destinies of the both sides, the one filled with vengeance, dark vengeance, vengeance that destroys, and rage that devours the both, but leaves one as a winner, a winner in disguise, a meaning hidden deep and a meaning that unearths the secret of this cruel, unfair, and at times fatuous humor of life, sometimes you cry to it, while. Sometimes you laugh, sometimes you mourn and sometimes you rejoice. Sometimes the music of life plays a grim tune, while sometimes it plays a merry tune, sometimes it makes you dance, while sometimes it makes you cry, and it plays it randomly. One a crow. The ghost of Serpon, leaves its corpse, and wafts towards the library, where lays Tyrone, reading about the history of Adion, its military strength and its weaknesses, and then the ghost enters his indulged soul. Sit here, as I recite to you, your goal, which is become the king, and kill Stalthorp, whispers the ghost in a serpentine voice. Are you the ghost of the king, is he dead? Says Tyrone, yes. Replied the ghost. Chapter 10. Tyrone or Stalthorp. The next day, the lifeless corpse of Serpon, with his head decapitated, a bloody wound on his heart and his skin colored red with dry blood was found, the courtiers suspected that Tyrone had murdered him, but it turned out that he was in the library all the day and all the night, it was still a mystery to the kingdom about who killed Serpon, but a new king had to be crowned, and if Serpon didn't have a courtier, then someone from the court would have to be crowned as king. It wasn't sure that Serpon had told only Stalthorp to be the heir, so the courtiers decided to choose their king, Stalthorp, or Tyrone, they voted their opinions, and the citizens of the kingdom also joined in to vote, and the result was astounding but obvious, Stalthorp was thrown the king, and Tyrone was removed from his post of minister, because of the court's unsure suspicion on Tyrone. Tyrone had plunged into grief, he walked to his chamber in his home, and his mind was teeming with misery, his innocence was not valued, he was falsely seen, and was misled, and now he is jobless and unemployed, perhaps, now he can't even be a peasant, due to his tarnished reputation to the kingdom. That night, 
When Tyrone had laid on his bed to catch a wink, the ghost of Serpon, with an ambitious and greedy motive flies to Tyrone's hut made up of mud and thatch, and whispers to him. When one hope has faded, then another blooms, for there's a place, where a soul traded, gives thee an army. Made of souls that spring out in fumes. Go to Arnal, the god of the underworld, and acquaint him for he is its master, and then go attack Stalthorpe. And crown thyself as king. After listening this, Tyrone wakes up, his hair tan gled in an unruly manner, but in his mind, a motive as strong as a rock, and in his eyes nothing but rage, and in his heart, determination to astound his new rival, who was once his friend, but just after he is promoted, his faith in him as if breaks apart and he turns green with envy. Then to this, Tyrone replies. But, O king, where is this palace you speak of? In which resides the person you say has the name of Arnal? Who offers an army of souls? Then, the ghost of Serpon says. Speak of it, for it is established on thy north, when you keep moving and see a gate. A castle made of wax, that's where he resides. And after that, Tyrone immediately starts preparing for the journey north. Chapter 11 The Underworld That night, the destiny of both the sides had turned, and devastated, now perhaps, only one. Side will reach this destination. Tyrone stood in the middle of the Cretan desert, gusts of wind laden with sand blew all over his face, occasionally entering his eyes, and then irritating him, his feet, as if stuck to the ground, stood still amidst the yellow sand, the terrain of the desert was rife with dunes, and whenever this sandy wind blew, the dunes changed its position slightly, and then, over the course of months, moved their position completely, miles away from their original place. Deleterious cacti were strewn all over the place, flowers sprung out of them. This desert was called by the local villagers, as the, Desert of Destiny, where destiny turns and twists and bends, and that was from where the glorious king of Crete's, Tracy Des the Great was born, he slowly reached to the post of the king, and then nearly conquered the whole world, but after he died, his glory was damaged and fell down with a thud, as this mighty Cretan bird became heavy with corruption. It was lonely for Tyrone, in the midst of this desert, the sky was dark and the atmosphere was silent, Pharaoh Sias hyenas could be hiding deep anywhere in this thought-provoking place, where poetic sentiments enter the pondering mind, laden with heavy words and heavy meanings. Tyrone kept walking for a bit, and then suddenly, as he stepped on a red rock, the castle of wax appeared on his left, and when he stepped up, it disappeared, how then, will he enter the castle? His mind was full with ideas, he took off his shoes and kept them on the rock, while he barefootedly walked to the castle of wax, it was a giant white castle, it had a tapered roof, and a giant garden, full of cacti, in the midst of the garden there was a fireplace, with skulls laid over its boundaries. He opened the gate which gave a strange, metallic squeaking sound when opened, and inside he could see the door, he walked up to the door, and then when he opened it, bats with red, scary eyes flew out from the door, it seemed as if a bat infestation had hit the place. The interior of the palace was dark but as he walked more and more through it, the moonlight shone through a giant window which was built above the roof, and then he could finally see the throne above which sat a ghost, his body was slender, and his stature was tall, he looked like someone who had been beaten several times. The castle was fairly lit up when the courtiers became visible, they all looked like Arnold but were shorter in stature than him, it was quite a scary scene to be honest, with bats hung upside down from the roof and snakes slithering all over the place. What are you here for, mere mortal? Said Arnal, with a frightening, deep voice which resounded all over the castle, I am here to trigger the flame of Seikasa, said Tyrone determinately and with a confident tone. Well, no one's came here for a long time, isn't it, and? Now you pop up and say you are going to sacrifice someone to get an army, well that's strange replied he, and to this the whole court laughed, and there was only one courtier who didn't laugh, Arnal drove his right hand, and with a serious face, drew it over to the courtier who wasn't laughing, a red streak flew out of his hand which then hit the courtier, and then his body faded. That's what happens to disloyal people, hopefully, you are not like him, follow me now, said Arnal, and stood from his throne, Tyrone followed him, out of the wax castle and to the cactus garden, where the flame of Seikasa stood. Chapter 12 The Sacrifice They had reached the flame of Seikasa, when Tyrone realized that he didn't have anybody he could sacrifice, but whom could he sacrifice then? Maybe his servant, but he had died earlier in the war, the only one left could be his wife, but it would be quite foolish to do so, at that moment, the ghost of Serpon sprung up and whispers, 
Sacrifice your wife, sacrifice. And the wife of Tyrone, Adraliah, a fair lady with sharp features appeared ahead of him, throw her. Said the ghost. He had no choice but to push Adraliah, she looked at her with her shining, innocent eyes that will make everyone cry with guilt over what they are doing. Against his will, he pushed her without speaking any. Word. Ah. That's it. Now this army of yours will be coming. Said Arnold, who was well acquainted with Tyrone, as he was astonished by his amazing loyalty to him, as he was ready to sacrifice her beloved wife. She fell into the blazing fire, her skin faded away into the air, and then after a moment, from the flame, sprung out fumes of murky, and then thousands of ghosts, spirits, and souls, anything you may call, wafted out of the flame of Sekasa. The army assembled themselves as troops, some were leading the way, as generals, while some had bows and arrows or spears in their hands, they all looked like they had amassed themselves in the shape of a giant ghost. The scene was thought-provoking, the army had assembled themselves before the moon, blocking the fresh moonlight which shone from it as they moved towards the castle of Crete's where Stalther presided and slept. They moved through the desert, wafting an HOV airing in the silent sky, twinkling and trooping themselves constantly. They had reached the garden of the Cretan Cotele, they needed a plan, the general of the army, Chaldeet, proposed a plan, they first enter the bodies of the soldiers that guarded the castle, and then light the castle using the torches they have in their hands. The plan was approved, and the souls entered the guards, with torches in their hands, the soldiers light up the castle, and the doors went down in blazes, the fire reaches the giant chamber of the first floor, where the army slept, they were now destined to perish under this fire, it also posed Stalthorpe in a calamitous position, as he won't have any army to fight with. The fire was steadily reaching the chambers of the top, where the king resided, his death was sure, right? Chapter 13 Fire in the Castle Till now, Tyrone was still in control of Serpon, and Stalthorpe in control of Andil, they were misled from their usual kind and generous nature, into the grim depths of treachery, they were both innocent, but weren't at the same time. The fire which had been lit the castle had reached the stairs, burning everything which came in its way, it burned the paintings, the walls on which those paintings were laid and it steadily slithered to the king's chamber, where its goal was to be fulfilled. Now amongst the army of ghosts, you may call it, was Adraliah, who had to join the army as she was sacrificed into the flame of Sekasa, she was betrayed, she wanted vengeance, like everyone in this story, so her rival was her husband, and her husband's rival was her ally, so it was in her duty to save Stalthorpe. She wafted up to the windows of the chamber, broke in, and saw the king, unaffected by the fire, snoring loudly as he laid in deep slumber, he dreamt of his awakening, his time to shine, but was blithe about his impending doom. Then, suddenly, he felt a soft, tender hand touching his face, it was Adraliah's hand, and to this abrupt touch, Stalthorpe waked up, and saw the ghost of her floating, her curly hair, and fair face shining, a fire is coming, let's leave. Said Adraliah, in a fast tone. And then she grabbed the hand of Stalthorpe, a flash of light accompanied and Stalthorpe landed down on a garden full of magnolias. Tyrone was gazing at the blazing castle, put up in flames by his loyal army, which had done their job and returned to the flame of Sekasa, leaving the venue, just as they entered, like a troop lined perfectly in order. The sun rose, and day dawned, the sunflowers stood up from their drooping face, and looked up at the new hope, that day, Tyrone, merry with his success, and his vengeance done returned to the castle of wax, to celebrate this milestone with his new acquaintance, the god of the underworld, Arnold. This is where this tale comes nearer and nearer to its destiny, when one hope is lost, then another one rises, and the destiny is won, by any means. War ends here. But destiny is not met. Part 2. Destiny. Thy fate is near, Stalthorpe. Chapter 14. Serpon's Ghost Leaves. It was noon, Heavy gusts of winds were blowing from the north, laden with sand from the desert. Of destiny, the weather was cloudy, and the clouds were a murky gray, this was a sign of tempestuous weather ahead. The sun was half blocked by the swelling clouds, which moved forth with the winds, the city of Adion, was once again bustling, after the death of Andil, Adion was counted under Cretes, so it was ruled by Stalthorpe, the throne was empty, and the fire of the castle was silenced, leaving the castle in ashes. After Stalthorpe had escaped the fire, the surviving courtiers were ruling the kingdom, knowing that Stalthorpe was not dead, but not revealing this information at the same time. 
Tyrone was delighted on knowing the death of his rival, because of him, his glorious post was snatched, his shining reputation defenestrated, and his mesmerizing wealth returned to the treasury. He left the gardens of the burning castle, towards the castle of wax, a feast was arranged on their success at the wax castle. He strode through the desert, initially happy, but as poetic sentiments entered his mind, he was guilty about what he had done, he knew that Stalthorp was innocent, he had been controlled by some ghost like he himself had been by Serpon, and he was also an extremely close friend of Stalthorp. By the time he reached the entrance of the castle, he was teeming with guilt over what he had done, he wasn't in guilt when he had sacrificed Adralia, because the ghost of Serpon had controlled him, the ghost must have left the earth, now that guilt has struck Tyrone. His mind was frequented by thoughts and memories of her wife, Adralia, she took extreme care of him, he reminisced about the day of their marriage, they had tried the knot by the side of the lake of Shetran, he felt he was the culprit, and she was the victim of betrayal. He entered the castle, his heart heavy with guilt, and his mind heavy with sentiments, Arnold was waiting for him on the large, red dinner table, above of which was food from every part of the world and wine from the best creeks of Cretes. Tyrone didn't eat much, as his mind was teeming with frequent thoughts of guilt which learned his mood and appetite, his eyes were drowsy, and he felt like sleeping, without eating much, he went to his chamber in the wax castle and slept. Chapter 15 The Death of Tyrone Stalthorpe and Adrelia stood on the field of Magnolias, brainstorming about a plan to kill Tyrone and gain vengeance, which they so surely deserved. The sun stooped down to the hills, and the sky turned orange, a streak of light was shot through the small gap between the hills, and made the field of magnolias shine under it. Snakes slithered from within the long grasses of the far fields, and ferocious dogs barked, as hunger hit them, birds were chirping, perched on the branches of giant eucalyptus trees, with green leaves, believed to possess medicinal qualities, and can cure anyone, of any disease, no matter what their age is. The murky clouds of grey hovered above them, wafting to the north, accompanied by the Cretan winds. Stalthorpe had came up with an idea, Adrelia would enter the dreams of Tyrone, and while she entices him, Stalthorpe will, with his bloody dagger, slay him, so that he shall never wake up, and vengeance shall be gained. And suddenly, a chariot of flying horses appeared, it was made up of gold, studded with gems, purple and green, and as it flew, a thin streak of white was let out of its back, the duo sat on the chariot, oh, horse, lead me to the castle of wax, for I shall kill the world's foe said Adrelia, in a yell. The chariot took off to the sky, piercing the clouds, and they were flying above the clouds, where everything was dark, they soared fast and high, above them the star-strewn sky was twinkling, and glistening, they passed the moon, or else the moon passed them. They steadily lowered their height, skimming the clouds, and then suddenly, diving out, now the clouds were above them, they had cut a straight hole from the clouds, they headed towards the midst of the desert, where the rock which opened the castle stood. The chariot landed them, and then took off to the heavens, where it belonged, the duo was bewildered, maybe the chariot had took them on the wrong path, and now they were on the wrong destination, but the flying chariot doesn't ever do that. As they walked towards the west, Stalthorpe accidentally stepped on the rock, and saw the castle of wax, ahead of them, its white wax, gleaming under the moonlight. Stalthorpe took off his shoes on the rock and barefootedly walked to the castle of wax, the moment he touched the gate, thorns pricked out of it, and hurt his hands, they had to override and enter the castle by climbing the walls, the ghost of Adrelia held Stalthorpe's hand, and flew above the walls, into the garden of cacti. She landed him on a rock, amidst the deleterious cacti, of which the garden was rife of, while she went into Tyrone's garden to entice him, she wafted up the window, broke in quietly and entered the slumberous Tyrone's dreams. While she enticed him, Stalthorpe entered the castle sneakily climbing the stairs while the court was feasting, and entered the chamber of the sleeping Tyrone. He held his bloody dagger tight in his hand, and stabbed Tyrone on his heart, blood gushed out of the wound, and Adrelia flew out. Who is that? You. Spoke Arnel abruptly, as he witnessed the bloody corpse of Tyrone. Chapter 16. Death of Arnel and Stalthorpe. Your fate is near, Stalthorpe. Whether thou wilt be successful in this campaign, I knowst not. But I do know, that thy heart will be heavy with mindless bloodshed. We may fail. And thou shalt win. But don't underestimate us, for destiny is not foreseeable. Even with the finest of foretellers. It is like a book with a misleading cover, thou knowst not how it will end. 
said Arnold, as he looked at Stalthorpe, teeming with rage on the death of his beloved acquaintance. I do knowst that, but thy shoulders are heavy with sins. And to kill or not, was I confused. I didst know that thou forced an innocent person, to throw her own wife into a flame. And vengeance shall be taken. Even if death shows its dark visage. Replied Stalthorp. Thy death is near. And soon thy life will be dear, a red curse is woven. From which thy death will show, and the god of death will come. In the guise of an annoying crow. Replied he, while he drew his hand, and uttered a strange spell which went like. Spin this curse. Which when hits a soul, takes life out of it. And then he hit the curse to Stalthorp, and the moment it touched his skin, the curse backfired, it returned to its thrower, and it hit him, Arnold faded the second the curse hit him, but the curse didn't fade, it hit the walls of the wax castle, and the castle started burning, its roof fell, and under it perished Stalthorp. You might think that destiny is met, but it isn't. Stalthorp is dead, but his ally, the ghost of Adrelia, must help him, and maintain his responsibility to help an ally, but alas, how could she help now, now that he is dead, you might think that the last hope is lost, but destiny wants more. Adrelia leaves the burning castle, and floats up, towards the heavens, she pierced the clouds, passes the moon, and encounters the gods, where she says to the gods. O gods, I think that I deserveth something more. Than what I deserveth now, I was pushed into the flame, by the greed of my husband, yet I stayed innocent. Bid me some mercy. Let me be the god of innocence. And with it, the soul of Adrelia, turns into a god, a yellow, shining halo above her head and a giant harmonium in her hands. She could now give rebirth to anyone, as now she is a god, and look now, the destiny is changed, and comes nearer and nearer. She returns to the castle of burning wax, where she sees the ghost of Andil, as the soul of Stalthorpe had flown to the gods, to ask for shelter and mercy, Adrelia land down as an avatar of a human, and gives Andil a rebirth. Chapter 17 The Rebirth after their newly attained rebirths, Adrelia and Andil decide to marry, just by the side of the river, where she and Tyrone tied the knot, and the gods came to witness, as angels from the clouds landed down on the earth, and were rejoiced as destiny had been met. The weather had turned tempestuous once again, as grey murky clouds from the west floated above the river to gaze at this heavenly wedding, the angels sang songs of destiny. Rejoice, O oh rejoice, for destiny is here. Rejoice for war has ended layer by layer. Fortune has been mended. And the demons have been fended. The angels have came. Rejoice, oh rejoice. Sang they, in their godlike voices, flying as they sang their song. After this heavenly marriage, Andil and Adrelia ride the flying chariot towards the castle of Crete's and Adion, soaring through the clouds, passing by several towns, who peered at the new royal couple as they flew to the castle. The people from both the kingdoms, gazed and rejoiced. For all their worries were now gone, glory had revived, and in such an epic manner. They reached the castle, delighted, and as the king and queen sat on the throne, destiny had now been met. Such a strange thing is destiny. It revives hopes, and gives birth to new hopes. When the world is reigned by darkness, it gives it new light. When the world is buried deep in the abyss of misery, it pushes it out of its distraught state, and throws the world high into the sky, for us to reside. There between the clouds, free from all greed, and fresh with new hope. When a person has tarnished his reputation solemnly, it gives him a new life, a new image, a new glory for it to maintain and a new mindset fresh with positive sentiments. It gives spark to new creations, it feigns its death, and silently sets the world on fire, for good or for bad, but as they say, all's well that ends well. You might see, that everyone in this story, wants vengeance, but as they attain it, they give their life to the god of death, while only some, attained vengeance and destiny also accompanies them, win this war. And from then on, they lived happily, the peasants were given enough attention and the two states which were raging with strife, now calmed down, and side relief a unity had prevailed. Afterward. A writing on destiny, vengeance, and human folly. I wish I knew it earlier, but the world is a painting, a painting of a beautiful scenery which is the only pure thing in it all. For there in the depths of this scenery reside ants, ants named humans, ants who exploit this wondrous painting, by degrading its amazing background, and the painter is not at all happy. The painter wishes it didn't paint the ants at all, for now all they are doing is destroying this background of nature. The ants are fighting between themselves, 
slaying their acquaintances, spilling blood on the wonderful blue sky, their strife doesn't seem to have an end. No one seems to be the winner at all, so what does the painter do? The painter draws another amazing thing, which is but not visible to the eyes of the mere ants, a purpose and a destination of all of this strife. This invisible thing is named destiny. Vangsh Nagpal, author, 2022. About the author. Vangsh Nagpal is a 13-year-old writer and poet, who likes to write meaningful pieces of fiction and poetry, written exquisitely. He resides in Delhi, India. Also by Vangsh Nagpal. My Mind Has Thorns. An anthology of poetry written over the course of a year, contains bedazzling verse and deep meaning over diverse topics while keeping uniformity over its writing.